Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Professor John Howe. I'm Director of the Melbourne School of Government at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and we're delighted to bring you the 2021 John Button narration this evening. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon uh, which I'm presenting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands upon which everyone attending this webinar this evening um, is today. Um, the John Button narration is hosted annually by the Melbourne School of Government. Uh, the Melbourne School of Government provides a platform for informed, independent debate on contemporary issues of great significance to the future of Australia and our region. Our mission is to inspire and equip governments, business, social partners and individuals to meet the challenges of contemporary policy and governance through interdisciplinary, innovative education and research. We seek shared and sustainable solutions to these challenges. The John Button Foundation was established in 2009 in memory of John Button, the late industry minister, senator and writer. In 2016, the John Button Fund was transitioned to the University of Melbourne and has since been managed by the Melbourne School of Government. It's our privilege to continue the work of the fund in honour of John Button's significant and substantial contribution to Australian politics and public debate. Uh, there are two ways in which we honour John's legacy as a political leader and a deep thinker about policy and politics, the John Button narration and also the John Button Schools Prize. Before introducing our speaker for this evening's oration, I'd like to mention the John Button Schools Prize. The John uh, Button Fund enables us to award the prize every year, a prize that awards the best essay on a subject concerning Australia's future by a Victorian student who is in years 10 to 12 and is younger than 19. Essays submitted for the school prize discuss Australian politics or policy. They might address topics such as Australia's population, climate change, reconciliation, natural resources, taxation, foreign affairs, and so on. Big ideas for Australia's future. As we all know, the past two years have not been easy for students, particularly those in Victoria. I've got a VCE. I've had a son who completed VCE this year myself. They've experienced interruptions to their studies and social lives, being plunged in and out of remote learning. However, I was heartened to see that many of our younger generation are becoming more socially and politically aware and are willing to advocate for what they believe in. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the winner and the runners up of the 2020 John Button Prize, Amelia Lamanis, uh, a year 10 student at Camberwell Girls Grammar School, was selected as the winner of the 2020 John Button School Prize for her essay, Why Australia Needs to Engage in the Justice Reinvestment to Reduce Indigenous Incarceration Rates and Help Close the Gap. Congratulations to Amelia. Nalini Jacob Rossetti, a year 11 student at Nossel High School, uh, was one of the two runners up for the prize. Um, Nalini was selected as first runner up for her essay, Don't Let the Big Bugs Bite, Tackling Fatigue in the Australian Workplace. And I think um, many of us are certainly experiencing even more fatigue uh, after 2021. Mia Kufalis, a year 11 student at Ivanhoe Grammar Girls Grammar, sorry, Ivanhoe Girls Grammar School, um, was selected as the second runner up um, for her essay, Navigating the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Australia needs to moderate the integration of artificial intelligence into the workplace. Another um, issue of continuing 
relevance and, and urgency. I congratulate these students on submitting such well thought out and stimulating essays during such a difficult period. If you're interested in learning more um, about the prize and reading uh, these essays, um, you can find them on the Melbourne School of Government website. And finally, I'd just like to thank the John Button Prize judging committee members who generously gave up their time to read through and evaluate all the shortlisted essays. They are Dr. Tom Daly, our Deputy Director at the Melbourne School of Government, the Honorary Judith Troth um, uh, AM, former Senator for Victoria, Jerry Martin from the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, Alistair King, also from the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, Inala Cooper, Director of Murrup Barrack here at the University of Melbourne, and Swathi Shunmarka Sundaram, who's a producer of Youth Impact on the ABC and Victorian State Representative to the Multi Multicultural Youth Advocacy Network. We really appreciate those people giving their time to the prize and thank them for supporting this initiative. The John Button School Prize will resume in 2022. So if you know of any students who are going to be in year 10 to 12 next year and might be interested in the prize, please encourage them particip to participate. And now uh, gives me great, great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the oration this evening, Danielle Wood, CEO of the Grattan Institute. Danielle um, is the CEO of the Institute and also leads Grattan's budgets and government program. She has published extensively on economic reform priorities, budgets, tax reform, generational inequality, and reforming political institutions. Danielle previously worked at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, uh, NERA Economic Consulting, and the Productivity Commission. Danielle is the president of the Economic Society of Australia and was the co-founder and first chair of the, Wom the Women in Economics Network. She is a member of the Parliamentary Budget Office Expert Advisory Committee, the Australian New Zealand School of Government Research Committee, the Commonwealth Bank CEO Advisory Council, and the PwC Future of Work Committee. Tonight's oration topic is The Next Generations Australia. Drawing on her extensive work on economic reform and systemic inequality, Danielle will discuss how today's policy makers can better reflect tomorrow's voices. Please uh, welcome uh, Danielle Wood. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, John. Uh, and thank you to all our audience for joining us tonight. I am coming to you today from Grattan's Carlton office, also on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past and present. In a speech about generational obligation, I want to recognise the way traditional owners fostered the invisible bond between their people, past, present and future. Through the idea of care for country, nurturing land, water, flora and fauna, and passing on the knowledge of how to maintain the equilibrium via stories and laws, the bonds between generations were self-perpetuating. The very idea that people at a point in time would draw on resources at the expense of others to come would have been very foreign to them indeed. And I think there is much we can learn. I was really delighted to be invited to give this evening's John Button oration. John Button was Australia's longest serving industry minister and by all accounts, a man of principle. I suspect he would be both dismayed but also galvanized by the state of affairs that I wanna to touch on today. John Button's legacy made a big impression on me as a young economist. He led the transformation of Australia's industry policy helping ensure Australia was competitive in increasingly global markets. This was forward looking and brave. Some jobs were lost as in any transition, but a huge number of jobs were also created elsewhere. And the changes helped improve Australia's living standards for decades to come. The management of this transition has important lessons for today. Economic change comes regardless of actions by governments. By being on the front foot and actively managing the transition, Disruptions to jobs and lives can be minimised and Australia can have the best chance to flourish. Putting one's head in the sand might be politically easier, but it generally leads to more pain in the long run. 
John Button, like the best leaders, was able to see what was on the horizon and take necessary actions. I was particularly delighted to be invited to speak by James Button, uh, John's son and also a former colleague. If someone's legacy is to be at least partly judged by the children they raise, then John leaves an extra large one. Uh, James is a magnificent writer and intellect and also a thoughtful and kind human being. Of course, this legacy is one also very much shared by John's other family, his son Nick, who I believe is joining us tonight, uh, and David, who the family lost a long time ago, his stepdaughters, Kate and Jane, and his partners, uh, Marjorie, Dorothy, and later Joan Grant. Great achievements inevitably require significant sacrifices, and these sacrifices are almost always shared by family members, and they absolutely deserve recognition. So thank you to John's family, uh, thank you to, to John Howe, and thank you to the Melbourne School of Government for the invite to be here today. Part one, a tale of two protests. On Friday the 30th of November 2018, thousands of school students took leave from the classroom to attend mass rallies around Australia. With an estimated 300,000 attendees across the country and parallel events across the world, the strike for climate action grabbed headlines. Children from primary school to high school, cities to regions, came out to say enough is enough. They were worried about the future they would inherit. These students were decades too young to be sitting around mahogany tables deciding on Australia's policies to tackle climate change. They were too young even to cast a vote in the elections that helped decide these policies. Instead, they made their voices heard using the one tool they have, their right to protest. Lucy Atkin Bolton, aged 11, the school captain of Forest Lodge Public School in New South Wales noted, I'm the school captain at my primary school. We've been taught what it means to be a leader. You have to think about other people. When kids make a mess, adults tell us to clean it up. And that's fair. But when our leaders make a mess, they're leaving it for us to clean up. Young people are often criticised for their political apathy. So how is this extraordinary mass display of caring, really caring about policy and their futures received? Our Prime Minister Scott Morrison urged students not to take part in the protest and told them to be less activist. The Resources Minister Matt Canavan said he would prefer students to learn about mining and science. The best thing you'll learn about a, from a protest is how to join the dole queue. The same day at DY RSL in Sydney, there was another uprising. Far more mannered, but at times no less passionate, retirees with share portfolios gathered to front politicians and share their views on Labor's policy to remove tax refunds for franking credits. It was unusual for a parliamentary inquiry, both for being an inquiry into the opposition's policy, but also in that members of the public were invited to, to make statements and share their view to a cross-party committee of politicians. In brisk three-minute windows, they made their dissatisfaction clear. The retirees that spoke that day all stood to lose their franking credit refund checks. For members of a couple, that meant they had a minimum of $1 million in assets. Most had substantially more. They received refund checks rather than a tax deduction because they paid little or no tax on their income from this wealth. Even couples with more than $4 million in assets could still benefit from the refunds. All those speaking firmly condemned the policy as unfair, even akin to stealing. And almost everyone explained that they were not rich and they had worked hard for their savings. Barry Nolan spoke first and tapped the mood. I was pleased to hear from ACOS that I am now in the upper middle class because superannuation funds has assets exceeding $1 million. However, since we are an egalitarian country, I don't consider myself to be in the upper class. If this proposal comes into effect, what are the implications for me and what am I going to do in response to it? First, I think I will book a large number of cruises to last me for the next 10 years or so. That will diminish the fund. I will make improvements to the house. I will probably put in solar panels and a few things, no batteries, and I will whittle away the fund until I qualify for the pension. It is becoming increasingly difficult for me to provide an upper class lifestyle from the fund that I have. If you take away the imputation credits, which account for a significant amount of my income, it is a lost cause. From there, the inquiry continued. Hearings were held around the country, from Torquay to Townsville. Disaffected self-funded retirees featured on the front pages of newspapers for weeks, peaking with one delivering an infamous 7.30 interview from the back of his yacht eating Tim Tams. Their concern about the policy was genuine. Many were shaken at the prospect of losing thousands of dollars a year in income. That is entirely understandable. But my question is, how did we land in a place 
were a proposal that asked a group of comfortably well-off retirees to make some tax contribution for the long-run sustainability of public services generates far more media attention, political backlash, and ultimately policy shifts than an entire generation calling for an inhabitable world. Part two, a fraying generational bargain. Both 11-year-old school captain, Lucy Aitken Bolton, and retiree Barry Nolan made powerful statements on the same day. And despite their different subject matter, both unwittingly touched on the idea of the generational bargain. The bargain is an implicit contract between generations. It is underpinned by the recognition of one generation to the other. Families are built around it. We care for our children and grandchildren, and they in turn care for us in older age. And while our first concern is for those nearest and dearest, we also feel a wider duty of care to other, to other generations. Society is held together by this mutual dependence between people of different ages. But from an economic perspective, what does one generation owe to the next? The question generates an unusual alignment across ethical schools. If we accept that people born at one point in time are no less deserving, even though they will be shaped by different forces, then an egalitarian approach said that we should should embrace the principle of intergenerational neutrality. No generation should be preferenced above another. If we consider the famous Rawlsian veil, if we were to be randomly allocated to any generation, past or future, without knowing which, what type of intergenerational transfers would we like to see? Rawls argued that once we have passed the point in time when generations should make a forward payment to build just institutions, there would be no case for positive transfers. So each generation stands on its own two feet on average. That sounds reasonable. One exception that egalitarians advanced was if there is a legitimate expectation of a major future shock to future well-being. For example, an environmental catastrophe. Hold that thought. People today should at least partly compensate future generations for that harm. Libertarianism also provides a foundation for principles of intergenerational justice. While individuals may have the right of private output applied to property, this is justified so long as there is enough and as good for those who follow. Translated into intergenerational terms, this implies future generations should have the same opportunities as if the previous generation had done nothing. Importantly though, there is no ethical framework that justifies people taking more today at the expense of future generations. In Australia and much of the world's recent history, the, generation, the, uh, the generational bargain has gone beyond what ethical principles would demand. The bargain has been both generous and hopeful. We aspire to leave the world a better place for future generations. And in many ways we have delivered. Since the Second World War, each generation has been substantially healthier, wealthier and better housed than their parents at the same age. But is this generation on generation progress guaranteed? The answer is no. And for many reasons I'm going to detail, I believe the long-standing bargain is fraying at the edges. We are making decisions that preference current generations over future ones. But I'm not here tonight to put my hands up in despair. The generational bargain might be frayed, but it is not broken. I genuinely do not believe middle-aged and older Australians today care less about our future Australians than previous generations. But the need for that care to find expression in our policy choices is becoming more urgent. Part three, have you ever had a pay rise? What do generational labels even mean? The silent generation, boomers, generation X, millennials, Gen Z. The boundaries are fuzzy, but generational cohorts are often grouped by demographers and sociologists to draw generalizations about those who grew up in similar times and have similar formative life experiences. In an economic sense, it is also true that generations share experiences that shape their ultimate living standards. If I only had one question to ask to identify someone's age by their economic experience, it would be this. Have you ever had a pay rise? For most of us, it seems a silly question. But for many under 35s, the answer, at least in terms of a pay rise that improved their real living standards, would be no. The 2008 global financial crisis, like all economic crises, saw employment take a hit. But unlike other crises, we were still seeing the effects in labour markets at the time the coronavirus began to disrupt our lives in 2020. 
While weak wages growth has bitten for all age groups, for younger people, it has been particularly pronounced. Workers aged 20 to 34 experienced close to zero real wage growth between 2008 and 2018. Contributing to poor outcomes is that younger people are falling down the jobs ladder, in the words of former Bank of England Chief Economist Andy Haldane. The Australian Productivity Commission found that people joining the workforce in the past decade have graduated into less attractive occupations on average for a given level of education than previous generations. And with young university graduates moving into lower level roles, other young people without the same qualifi qualifications are pushed even further down the ladder into jobs more likely to be characterised by part-time and casual work. This has been accompanied by a big rise in underemployment. Workers not getting all the hours they want, particularly amongst younger age groups. The overall effect of flatlining wages and rising underemployment, under 35s in 2018, on average, had lower incomes than those of the same age a decade earlier. And Australian youth are far from alone in this experience. Just before the COVID crisis, the Institute of Fiscal Studies in the UK released analysis to show that those born in the 1980s were the first post-war generation not to have higher median incomes in their early 30s than those born a decade earlier. Similarly, in the United States, millennials are less well off than members of earlier generations were when they were the same age, with both lower earnings and less wealth. The takeout is clear. When growth is weak and labour markets have excess capacity, younger people bear the brunt through stagnant wages and high underemployment. Without strategies to boost activity, productivity and wages, generation on generation progress in incomes is not guaranteed. Where young people emerge from the more recent COVID shock remains to be seen. Youth unemployment hit 16% at the worst of the crisis and underemployment touched another 24%. While jobs are bouncing back strongly, it is not yet clear whether we have the right policy settings to have our young people climbing that jobs ladder again. This must be a priority. And while the impact of labour market outcomes remains uncertain, what is clear is that the COVID shock has widened even further generational chasms in wealth. Part four, the great Australian nightmare. Since World War II, Australia has been a nation of homeowners. Home ownership rates peaked at over 71% in 1966. Almost three quarters of the nation was on the property ladder and living the dream. Home ownership was celebrated as an indicator of success, security and quality of life. Home ownership rates declined very gradually in following decades, but then sharply since the early 1990s when house prices and income started to diverge. At the 2016 census, home ownership rates were at their lowest level since 1954. But what has been particularly striking is the drop amongst young people. In 1981, when the boomer generation were settling down and having families, 67% of 30 year olds own their own home. In 2016, the equivalent figure was 45%. But even this hides a more concerning disparity, the huge fall amongst poorer young people. In 1981, 60% of the poorest 25 to 34 year olds owned a home. Today, that figure is just 20%. In contrast, for the richest 20% of young people, ownership rates have fallen only modestly in 40 years. Demolishing the suggestion that the plummeting ownership rates overall reflect different preferences or the breakfast choices of today's young people. Young people want to own their own home as much as ever. But the fact remains that it is now only the richest ones or the ones with the richest parents that can afford to. Along with the challenges of renting in a country that has some of the least friendly rental laws in the world, the locking of young people out of the housing market has undercut their capacity to accumulate wealth, especially compared to older generations that have reaped the windfall gains in wealth that have come from those spectacular rises in house prices and those of us other assets over the past 25 years. The wealth of households under 35 has barely moved in 15 years. And poorer young households today have less than poorer young households did 15 years ago. In contrast, wealth for older households has grown rapidly on average. A household headed by someone aged 65 to 74 
had on average 1.3 million assets in 2017, up from 900,000 for the same age group in 2004. Rising asset prices over the past five years mean this figure is almost certainly substantially higher now. These growing wealth gaps are not because young people don't work hard. More young people today combine work with post-school study to get by. And if they are lucky enough to get a full-time job on graduation, they can expect to be working on average around 38 to 39 hours a week, the same as their parents were back in the 1980s. Nor can we blame too many avocado brunches. Young people spend less on discretionary items, recreation, alcohol, tobacco, clothes and personal care, household services and furnishings in real terms today than people of the same age did three decades ago. To the extent they are spending more, it is on essentials, housing, power, food, medical care and transport, with rising housing costs being, being the single biggest contributor. Let me be clear about what younger people and indeed some older people are up against. Think about your job in the past year, if you were one of the lucky ones that had one, and everything that you put into it, the hours, physical, mental, emotional energy. For those life-dominating efforts, the average Australian worker earned about 68,000, or just over 90,000 for the average full-time worker. Now think about your house if you were lucky enough to own one, your shelter, the place that you return home to. I'm sure you probably spent some time on maintenance and upkeep, but unless you're featuring in the next season of Grand Designs, I'm guessing it consumes substantially less of your time and energy than your job did. Guess what your house made last year? About $140,000 for the average house in Victoria, more than $200,000 for the average house in New South Wales. How can it be that a relatively low risk, low effort investment can provide greater returns than a year of hard work? And for those saving for a deposit, they are almost invariably further away than they were a year ago. Part five, the Jane Austen world. The inevitable riposte to these concerns about widening gaps in generational wealth accumulation is, well, inheritances will fix the problem. It is true that inheritances will be a huge feature of the Australian economy in future decades. With a swelling of our national household wealth to 13.4 trillion, up more than 120% since the GFC, most in the hands of older Australians, there is an awfully big pot of wealth to be passed on. Big inheritances boost the jackpot from the birth lottery. Richer parents tend to have richer children. Among those who received an inheritance over the past decade, the wealthiest 20% received on average three times as much as the poorest 20%. And inheritances are increasingly coming later in life. As the miracles of modern medicine have extended life expectancy, the age at which children inherit has increased. The most common age to receive an inheritance is late 50s or early 60s, much, much later than the money is needed to ease the midlife squeeze of housing and children that Gen Ys face. Of course, many parents are dipping into their savings to help children into housing now. Reserve Bank Governor Lucy Ellis bailed the cat earlier this week that this is now the only realistic way for many young Australians to enter the housing market. But this too is mainly the domain of the wealthy. Large intergenerational wealth transfers can change the shape of society. They mean a person's economic outcomes relate more to who their parents are than to their own talent or hard work. French economist Thomas Piketty warned of a Jane Austen world where inequality is exacerbated by ever-growing inheritances. Easing intergenerational inequality means policies that work for the whole generation and not just those lucky enough to have a private safety net. Part six, an intergenerational spindle. Demography is destiny, or so French sociologist Auguste Comte told us. Every five years, the Australian government releases an intergenerational report, reminding us of one facet of that destiny, that without action, an ageing population and other changes will leave public finances looking ugly. The fallout from COVID means the 2021 report was a sea of red. Budget deficits for 40 years, net debt still at 34% of GDP in 2061, and the interest cost of servicing that debt growing to 1.7% of GDP. But even these numbers are based on rosy assumptions about productivity and discounting the future costs of climate change. The underlying structural challenge comes from the different size of different generations 
and the implicit generational bargain we have weaved into our tax and welfare system. Working age Australians as a group are net contributors to the budget. They put more in in taxes than they get back in either welfare benefits or spending. Those contributions help support older Australians who take a lot more out in spending and pension payments than they contribute in taxes. Today's working age Australians, of course, anticipate that the generation after them will support them in the same way as they age. So far, so fair. But what will make it more challenging for today's young people to uphold their end of the bargain is the destiny of demography is working against them. The number of working age Australians for every person age 65 and older fell from 7.4 in the mid 1970s to 4.4 in 2015, and is projected to fall to 3.2 in 2055. This could be seen as just bad luck for today's young people. There are swings and roundabouts that all generations have had to grapple with. But what I think is less easy to accept is a series of policy decisions that have substantially increased the size of intergenerational transfers, supercharging these future demographic pressures. First, health spending is climbing. Commonwealth health spending has climbed by 3% a year over and above inflation for the past decade. State health spending has grown at 3.7% a year in real terms. The increase has been particularly stark for those in their 70s and 80s, with average health spend per person increasing by more than $4,000 in just 12 years. Second, aged care spending is growing strongly. Australian government spending on aged care increased by over 40% in real terms since 2012-13. While the number of people living in residential aged care facilities has remained relatively stable in recent years, the number of people accessing a home care package has increased markedly, growing from around 60,000 in 2015 to around 170,000 by the end of last year. Changes in the recent budget are expected to add about 4.5 billion per year in extra spending. Most Australians support this additional health and aged care spending. And the result, providing older people with longer, healthier, more fulfilling lives is something that we should be proud of as a nation. But at the same time, as a country, we've decided to pay more to support better outcomes for older Australians. We've also made a series of tax policy decisions, tax-free super in retirement, refundable franking credits, special tax offsets for seniors, which means we are now asking older Australians to make a much smaller contribution to the delivery of services than we once did. Incomes for households over 65 have more than doubled over the past 25 years. That's substantially faster than the growth in incomes for other age groups. But despite that, households over 65 pay virtually no more income tax than the people of the same age did 25 years ago. Indeed, the share of older households paying any tax has fallen from 27% in the mid 1990s to 17% today. And that's contributed to a tax system where someone's date of birth is almost as important as their income in determining their tax contribution. An older household with an income of $100,000 a year pays about the same tax as a working age household on 50,000. There is simply no policy justification for that degree of age segregation in the tax system. One argument that is sometimes advanced to defend the generosity of age-based tax breaks is that older Australians have paid their taxes. But the idea of the tax system as an individual's piggy bank is silly if you believe in a progressive tax and welfare system and the provision of public goods like roads and defence. Nor does it hold water in a generational sense. Younger households are underwriting the living standards of older households to a much greater extent than in the past. People born in the late 1940s at the beginning of the baby boom generation reached their peak contribution to the tax system in their early 40s. At that point, they were contributing about 3,200 a year in today's dollars to support older generations in retirement. An average 40-year-old today, born at the tail end of Generation X, is paying about 7,300 a year. That is more than they are contributing to their own retirement through compulsory superannuation. Under current policy settings, the child of today's 40-year-old will need to pay an inflation-adjusted 11,400 by the time he or she reaches 40 to sustain the current levels of benefits in retirement. That is what the intergenerational report reminds us of, that without policy changes, budget deficits are set to grow and net debt will increase as a share of the economy in decades to come. 
This unwanted fiscal inheritance will fall on the generation of Australians who have seen their incomes and wealth stagnate. The same generation who missed the property boom and entered the workforce during a period of flatlining real wages. Part seven, at what cost the planet? But all of these debates about tax and even house prices seem small compared to the ultimate generational transfer. The impost of changing climate and shifting of most of the heavy lifting on mitigation to the next generation. Climate change policy debates come with thorny ethical issues. To what extent should we discount future harms from today's decisions? How do we factor in likely improvements in technology in deciding the right time path for action? How much extra lifting should the developed world do to reflect the fact that we've already reaped the economic benefits from carbon intensive development? These are interesting and really important questions, but the bottom line is, is we are a long way from these gray zones. The world has not done enough and is unlikely to do enough based on the most recent Glasgow negotiations to keep temperature rises within the 1.5 degrees needed to avert serious and potentially irreversible shifts in environmental systems. Scientists estimate that at 1.5 degrees, which we are on track to reach in the next decade, intense heat waves will happen at four times the historical rate and droughts and floods almost twice the historical rate. At rises of two degrees, which is on the cards between now and 2050, without a much more significant ambition from the world to reduce emissions, a bushfire event of the magnitude of our disastrous 2019-20 summer will be four times as likely to occur. Also at two degrees, only 1% of the corals in the Great Barrier Reef will survive. Large parts of the world will become uninhabitable and the World Bank predicts there'll be 143 million climate refugees by 2050 in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America alone. In the words of United Nations Secretary Antonio Guterres, a code read for humanity. Weigh this up against the idea that we should bear some modest cost to our lifestyle today and make an investment in transitioning carbon intensive jobs and regions. And it seems less like the greatest moral challenge of our time and more like a clear moral imperative. That is why it is extraordinarily frustrating to see the political sideshow that is climate policy in Australia. As a close follower of the news, I read, heard and watched hundreds, probably thousands of stories about Australia's climate policy in the lead up to the COP26 conference. The vast majority focused on trivialities regarding the coalition and opposition's maneuvering and messaging. Would Australia support net zero by 2050, preferably or without qualifier? How much would the nationals extract in regional pork barrels for their commitment? What did Matt Canavan tweet today? Will Anthony Albanese get politically wedged on the issue? I can't speak for the rest of the 80% of Australians who support climate action, but I suspect many shared my frustration that for all the heat and light, Australia turned up to Glasgow with nothing but a techno-optimist PowerPoint deck and a check in the mail to improve in 30 years time. I'm gonna leave the policy postmortem to my expert Grattan Institute colleagues, Tony Wood and Alison Reeve. But what I do wanna explore is why in this tsunami of coverage on the issue, was there virtually no mention of the intergenerational case for acting? Almost no mention of the impacts of global inaction on our children and their children's safety, health, economic opportunities and wellbeing. Not from the media, not from the government, and nor from the opposition. I heard, I think, probably hours of Barnaby, Barnaby Joyce opining about the impacts of policies on the jobs of 0.2% of the Australian population, but I did not hear him face a single question about the lives of future generations. The Treasurer, the Business Council, the opposition leader did articulate a compelling case for Australia to act, but their focus was on avoiding trade and capital market penalties for recalcitrants, and getting first mover advantage on green industries and jobs. Those play to the self-interest of today's generations rather than appeal to their sense of obligation to future ones. So what should we take from this? Are we a venal bunch with no care for the future? I don't believe this is the case, but at the very least, the media's insatiable appetite for the new and shiny and seeming inability to differentiate its tone and coverage for those issues that are small and those that are very large seems extremely ill-suited to quality coverage of a slow moving but existential threat to humanity like climate change. We need to do better. 
Part eight, what does better look like? What would make a better Australia for the next generation is not a simple question. We should listen to the voices of young people and what they think is needed. A coalition of youth organised groups, including Think Forward, the Foundation for Young Australians, Youth Action, Youth Development Australia, and the Youth Affairs Councils from several states, have called for a parliamentary inquiry to start the conversation on intergenerational fairness. They take their inspiration from a 2018 House of Lords inquiry in the UK. The report from this inquiry, Tackling Intergenerational Unfairness, was published in 2019. It observes that intergenerational fairness has become an increasingly pressing concern for both policymakers and the public. The report found that the relationship between older and younger generations is still defined by mutual support and affection. However, the action and inaction by successive governments risks undermining the foundation of this relationship. Many in younger generations are struggling to find secure, well-paid jobs, and secure, affordable housing, while many in older generations risk not receiving the support they need because government after government has failed to plan for a long-term generational timescale. It all sounds highly familiar. I wholeheartedly support these young people's calls for an Australian parliamentary inquiry. And if I can treat this as a preemptive submission, I would like to highlight the following priorities. First, getting our macroeconomic policy settings right with a focus on creating jobs and lifting wages growth. This means not being trigger happy on interest rates on the first sign of inflation and not pushing for budget consolidation until unemployment is durably low and wages are rising. Second, we need to revisit the long list of productivity enhancing reforms advanced by Grattan Institute, federal and state productivity commissions, as well as others that can boost long-term living standards. Third, not increasing the superannuation guarantee, compulsorily taking more money off young people now when they need it, given that they are already being forced to save for higher living standards in retirement than they enjoy today, makes no sense. Fourth, serious steps on housing affordability, including boosting housing supply by changing planning rules to allow for more homes in the inner and middle rings of our capital cities, reducing tax breaks for investment in housing, including uh, reducing the capital gains tax discount to 25% and winding back negative gearing, and exploring more innovative proposals like shared equity schemes. Fifth, improving outcomes for people that don't own their own homes by changing rental laws to give tenants more rights, increasing the supply of social housing and boosting rest, rent assistance for those on income support. Six, increasing support for accessible and affordable early learning and care giving the next generation the opportunity for enriching childhood development while providing their parents that participate in the paid workforce with support without facing prohibitive out-of-pocket costs. Seventh, winding back age-based tax breaks by taxing superannuation earnings in retirement at 15%, removing the seniors and pensioners tax offset and special, special Medicare levy rate for over 65s. This would re-establish the principle that income tax contributions will be based on income rather than age. And crucially, it would represent a de-escalation of policy decisions that cumulatively ask working age Australians to underwrite much larger transfers to older Australians than any previous generation has supported. Finally, we should seriously grapple with taxes on intergenerational transfers, at least for very large ones. If the money collected were used to fund income tax cuts, most people under 50 would be ahead financially. At a minimum, we should not be subsidising inheritances via some existing rules that allow the accumulated value of super tax breaks to be inherited by the next generation, as well as the exclusion of virtually all of the family home from the age pension asset test. And whether or not it is in scope for such an inquiry, Australia should align with other developed nations to set more ambitious targets for emissions reductions by 2030, including a proper set of policies to help us get there. If governments are looking for inspiration, uh, the recent Grattan Net Zero series is filled with evidence-based suggestions on relatively low cost things we could do right now that would help put Australia on the right trajectory. The alternative is we continue to be part of the problem rather than the solution to this generational, indeed existential global challenge. Part nine, calling time on generational warfare. I understand today that my comments are strong and my policy suggestions might feel confronting. 
I might be accused of trying to whip up generational conflict. But let me be clear, that's the exact opposite to what I hope to achieve. I believe that most Australians care deeply for other generations and want to restore the hopeful bargain. For all the Gen Z, OK Boomer, eye rolling, young Australians gave up their social lives and in some cases their jobs to protect the welfare of older and more vulnerable Australians during COVID. Polling through the pandemic suggested young Australians were more strongly in favour of lockdowns than any other cohort. And for all the pious Boomer lectures about brunch choices, much of the concern I hear from about house prices and their impacts actually comes from the older generations, many of whom say they'd be happy to see their house worth less if it was going to ease the pressure on their children and their generation. Similarly, look around any climate change lecture or protest and you will find grey-haired attendees as common as tattooed ones in the crowd. Care for the future is alive and well. A proper debate about the impacts of policy settings on the outcomes for different generations can only occur when we once and for all reject generational exceptionalism. The damaging belief that differences in life outcomes between generations are driven by differences in work ethic, talent or attitude, rather than luck and policy choices. American political philosopher Michael Sandel notes how such belief systems corrode civic sensibilities. The more we think of ourselves as self-made and self-sufficient, the harder it is to learn gratitude and humility. And without these sentiments, it is hard to care for the common good. While every generation has its own unique challenges and opportunities, the only rational place to start is that people born at different points in time are no less deserving than others. So let's drop the generational warfare and work together to ensure that the Australia we leave our children is better than the one we inherited. With the right policy settings, I believe that we can restore the hopeful bargain. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, thank you for your time and your insights uh, this evening. I, I really do um, hope that your eloquent and evidence-based expose on intergenerational inequality and unfairness um, will make this a major policy issue and debate going into the um, next federal election. And at the very least, um, I do hope we get the parliamentary inquiry that um, you support. Uh, thank you also to the um, Grattan Institute uh, for providing the technical support for this evening's lecture. We really appreciate that. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude to the John um, to John Button's family and in particular um, James Button for his support in relation to uh, this evening's lecture. Uh, and I also want to thank the supporters of the John Button Fund, many of whom are attending the lecture this evening uh, as well. And thank you to uh, all of our guests um, attending this evening. We really appreciate, appreciate you making the time to uh, attend this lecture, and we hope to see you um, at our future events. Thanks very much. <laughs>